This is my Ride One Up Roadster V2 commuter bike, road bike, something bike. Yeah, let's talk about it. So this is my bike that I have been using to commute to and from work and to save a whole bunch of money. I made the decision to purchase an e-bike as a means to save money on fuel costs. I had been considering this move for quite some time and as the cost of gasoline in Southern California was significantly on the rise, reaching as high as $7 per gallon at some stations, my primary mode of transportation is a Toyota Tundra, which is a gas guzzler and the monthly fuel costs were becoming a significant strain on my budget. I could have simply ridden my normal road bike to save money, but I wanted a motor assist for a few reasons. Firstly, I wanted to cut down the time it took me to commute to and from work. The added power from the motor made it possible for me to cover longer distances in a shorter amount of time, which was a real time saver. Secondly, on days when I was feeling tired, the motor assistance was a huge help. It gave me the extra boost that I needed to get through my commute, and I was able to arrive at work feeling both refreshed and ready to tackle the day. So in the end, I made the investment in an e-bike and I have not looked back since. The fuel savings have been substantial and the added convenience of the motor has made my daily commute much more enjoyable. The handlebars that came with the original bike are unfortunately quite inadequate in size. They are nearly 550 millimeters in width, making them narrow and somewhat comically small to be quite honest. You know, this narrow size may be ideal for navigating through busy city traffic, but for everyday riding, they're seriously limiting. And as someone who is used to wider handlebars found on mountain bikes, which can be as wide as 800 millimeters, the small size is particularly noticeable. A wider handlebar provides more stability and control on the bike, especially during descents and when navigating rough terrain. This is especially important for those who enjoy mountain biking, as wider handlebars allow for more effective control of the bike. On the other hand, narrow handlebars can lead to fatigue and discomfort, especially on longer rides. The small size of the original handlebars on this bike can make riding a less enjoyable experience, especially for those who are used to the wider handlebars. Battery life on this e-bike is generally decent, but there are some important factors to consider. The manufacturer's specifications state that the battery can last between 20 and 30 miles, but this is going to depend on the level of assistance that you're using, how much you weigh, how much you're carrying, and how flat the road is. So if you're using the first or second assistance level, you might be able to reach that 30 mile range, but in real world use, this is not always the case. For instance, on my 11 mile commute, which is relatively flat, the battery has sometimes depleted before I even get to work, especially so if there is a headwind. Now, this is where I'm typically using the third level of assistance. They do make an external battery pack for this bike, which can double the range, and it's an option. But to be honest, it really detracts from the appearance of this bike, which is really one of its strengths. The design of the bike is sleek, and doesn't look like a typical e-bike, with the only giveaway being the controller on the handlebars. So let's talk about the gearing on this bike. The gearing system on this bike has a few limitations that are worth considering. To start, it takes a bit of effort to push the large 64 tooth chainring to get the bike moving from a standstill. Now, this is due to the size of the chainring and the gearing system itself, which can make starting out a bit of a challenge. However, once you are up to speed, your cadence is actually really quite high in order to reach the rated speed of 24 miles per hour. Well, it's relatively easy to get up to the speeds of say 21 or 22 miles per hour, reaching that top speed does take some extra effort. So I really think that the gearing on this bike is actually kind of holding it back in my opinion. One of the major issues with this bike is the process of removing the rear wheel. In order to take off the wheel, you're going to have to unbolt both sides of the bike and disconnect the motor cable. Now, this can be a cumbersome process, especially if you're dealing with the flat while you're out riding. To make the process easier, 
I've opted to actually use a Velcro cable management tie instead of traditional zip ties to connect the motor cable. This allows me to easily disconnect the motor in the event of a flat tire, making it quicker and more convenient to replace the tube. However, despite the solution, changing a flat tire still can be quite a bit of a hassle, especially if you're on the go. One of the most distinctive features of this bike is its use of the belt drive system instead of a conventional chain drive. While the belt drive is generally considered to be quieter than a chain drive, it also prevents some unique challenges. One of the main issues with the belt drive is the tension. If you need to remove the rear wheel for any reason, you're gonna have to readjust the tension for the belt. This can be a little bit of a delicate process as it's easy to either over or under tighten it. So another problem that I've encountered with the belt drive is its tendency to skip under heavy pedaling. If you're someone who likes to get out of the saddle and apply a significant force to the cranks, you're probably gonna experience some belt slippage. This can be particularly frustrating if you're trying to navigate through an intersection quickly. However, the belt drive system has a significant advantage over a traditional chain drive system. Maintenance. Unlike a chain, the belt does not require regular lubrication, making it a much more convenient choice for those who don't want to have to worry about maintaining their bike. The gearing on this single speed bike is somewhat limited, particularly when it comes to tackling uphill climbs. The power assistance is helpful, but even on the maximum level of five, the motor can still struggle to keep up on a steep incline. I have experienced instances where the motor will just flat cut out and the battery indicator flashes, seemingly indicating that the battery has run out of power. However, after a brief cooling down period, the battery indicator showed that there was a significant amount of power left in the battery. This suggests that the issue was actually due to the system overheating and it needed to take a break rather than the battery being depleted. Real quick, if you guys are enjoying this video, hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel. And drop a comment down below, what's your thought on a commuter e-bike? Overall, the single speed design means that riders will need to rely on their own pedaling power more than they would if a bike had multiple gears. The Sandover Height presents a challenge for my wife, who is on the shorter side, and she cannot ride this bike at all. This is unfortunate because I'd actually hoped for her to also be able to enjoy riding this bike. Now, I do wish that the standover height was not nearly as tall as it does limit the accessibility of the bike to a wider range of riders. So the brake system that comes on this bike are some Tektro mechanical rim brakes. And I must admit, I don't have a lot of experience when it comes to rim brakes. I did find that these were adequate for my daily commuting needs. And while these brakes have met my basic requirements, I did find them to be somewhat lacking in power. And that being said, I decided to make an upgrade by switching these over to compressionless housings. For those unfamiliar with the term, compressionless brake housing refers to a type of cable system that provides increased brake performance and a more refined lever feel. This upgrade made a noticeable difference in the braking power and made the levers feel much more responsive. I'd highly recommend anyone looking to make a similar improvement to check out a video by Bike Sauce, who provides an excellent in-depth analysis of the subject. This bike has undergone several modifications from its original form. To start, I switched out the original handlebars for a drop bar setup. I had the parts left over from my Diamondback Hanjo bike from its recent upgrades, so I thought I'd throw them on here. With the addition of this front little bar, I was actually able to swap this over to a drop bar bike because I needed somewhere to house the little remote control. And this little bar just attaches to the front stem bolts. Another change that I made was upgrading the tires to some Continental Gator Hardshell tires. Yeah, I couldn't remember what they were. I had to look down. Um, I switched over to those with the intention of reducing rolling resistance and hopefully improving the battery range of the bike. Additionally, I installed a pannier rack and some bags provided by BB USA on the back of the bike. This has been extremely helpful for my daily commute as it allows me to carry my essentials without having to worry about carrying a backpack that's gonna make my 
back all sweaty. You know, given the affordable price of the Panier setup, I would definitely recommend it to anyone looking for a practical and efficient solution. Now, the charging process of this bike is quite efficient and it takes roughly about four to five hours to fully charge the battery from dead. Given that most people usually work for eight hours a day, this means that the bike will be fully charged and ready for use by the time you finish work. The bike is equipped with a hub motor, which is why it's significantly cheaper compared to some other mid-drive bikes. One aspect of the bike that I was a bit surprised by is the absence of a second water bottle mount. I would have expected to see an additional mount on the down tube but I guess it wasn't possible as that's where the battery is housed. The 36 volt, seven amp hour Samsung battery that does come with the bike can be swapped out mid ride if needed, but this is not a quick and easy process. From my understanding, it takes about 30 minutes to actually replace the battery. So it's best to plan ahead and make sure you have enough power for your ride. What do you guys think about this bike? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you like this video, hit that like button. This bike does come in two different versions technically. You have the standard road version, but they also do make a gravel version, which I actually would have preferred to have. It is a little bit more expensive, but with that, you do get disc brakes. So with the gravel edition of the bike, you do get some more gravel centric tires. The gearing is actually a bit different on that bike as well. This bike does actually come in a gravel edition, which I would have actually much preferred to have, partially because of the differences on that bike. First off, with that bike, you do get uh, disc brakes rather than the rim brakes. Secondly, it does have different gearing than this bike. And thirdly, with that one, you do get some actual gravel centric tires. So overall, can I recommend this bike? Yeah, I, I totally can. It's, it's been a great bike since I've had it. There, I do wish that it actually had a throttle for days that I'm feeling particularly lazy, but you know, for what it is, I can't complain. So this is a pretty cool bike. And if you wanna check out another cool bike, you should check out this video right here.